Hello, everybody. Welcome back to uh, our course, uh, Hopkins at Home. This is week four, our final uh, week of our um, incredible journey through the history of fake news from the flood to the apocalypse, as it were. Um, today, we're going to move uh, with warp speed from the period of the Renaissance and archaeological forgery um, and scholarly historical forgery, patriotic mythology, to the period of, um, of the Enlightenment, the 18th and on to the 19th century, to the age of bibliomania, as it's sometimes referred to. Um, and of course, the theme here is very well expressed in this image that I um, found when I put the word bibliomania into Google, which is this notion of literally being swallowed whole, drowning, as it were, in books um, and in the profusion of information uh, overload, uh, the flood of information that, that seems to uh, uh, take over our lives in, in so many different ways, and how forgery fits into that universe of mass culture, popular culture, um, uh, and not simply uh, or predominantly uh, learned cultures, as we've been uh, focusing on so far through the treasures of the Bibliotheca Fictiva. Um, this uh, theme uh, caused me immediately to think of uh, the late Professor Dick Maxey's incredible library, um, which you see before you, um, a perfect example uh, of bibliomania par excellence, just uh, a staggering space where so many generations of Hopkins students um, uh, learned so much from uh, Professor Maxey, who would literally pull rare books off his shelves uh, in profusion and put first editions in people's hands as they were talking about particular subjects. It's also the world of this uh, love and embrace of this information overload that um, gave rise to a whole new forest of forgery um, in the 18th and the 19th centuries. Um, I'm going to start with uh, one of my favorite uh, areas in this subject matter, so-called travel liars. Here are some images um, by Gustave Doré um, illustrating the rhyme of the ancient mariner, um, a wonderful um, book in our collection, but um, also uh, in the general collections of the Sheridan libraries. But I wanted to put these out as um, imaginings, twilight um, visions of a world beyond, beyond the places that we normally travel or that people in the 18th century thought they normally could travel, but at a time when the literature of travel had emerged as perhaps the most single most popular genre of literature, the armchair traveler literature of the late 17th and the 18th centuries. Now, we, uh, even in that literature, there is this uh, desire to, to, to know things that couldn't be known. Um, indeed, uh, on the part of one forger to re-Homer Homer himself, uh, whose own great, one of his two great epics is, of course, the Odyssey, uh, a travel through fanciful lands and miraculous spaces inhabited by gods um, uh, and, uh, and human beings of, of heroic and everyday proportions. I'm going to quote here from Pliny the Elder's Natural History, in which he describes the fashion, uh, a new fashion in libraries to decorate them with images, as indeed you see on the right, this wonderful alcove in the spectacular um, uh, Noah's Ark-like library of uh, Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. We must not forget the novel practice of likenesses, which are set up in libraries to honor those whose immortal spirits speak to us in those same places. So too models of imaginary likenesses that offer a sense of the loss of countenances not handed down to us, such as Homer's. We don't actually know what Homer looked like, just like we don't really know from the biblical text, the canonical biblical text, that is, we do know from pseudo-epigraphic texts, what Jesus Christ looked like. In 1773, uh, a, um, under the name Pas van Krienen, somebody published a brief description of the archipelago um, of the islands of the Cyclades in uh, the Greek Peloponnese uh, with this uh, title page, which um, towards the bottom also mentions in rather large letters, including the sepulcher of Homer and other celebrated people. Um, 
which is a, a, a very much a clue into what I'm about to talk about. If you read through this Italian vernacular text, no longer in Latin, but in a language that a lot of people could read, there's a section on the island of Neo, or Eos, as it was sometimes referred to. Uh, here you'll see an image of it in, in, in an early modern map. Uh, and uh, according to Pas von Krenen, uh, he was able to explore this island and discovered, amongst other things, the very uh, tomb of Homer himself, uh, this being the um, purported uh, homeland or birthplace of his mother, perhaps himself. Uh, and here, an actual, in the book, in the fold-out of this magnificent addition to the Bibliotheca Fictiva some years ago, uh, is an image of a fold-out engraving of the inscription on Homer's tomb. Um, which of course is ridiculous. If you, I actually googled this. If you, um, you can go to Eos, and indeed, even on Google Maps, you will find the tomb of Homer. And apparently, there are lots of tourist pictures on Flickr that show you that there's some version of Homer's tomb even there today, and some 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 uh, stone still, as it were, that have been placed in the ground nearby that look rather strange, but state that at this location covers the earth, the sacred head of the leader of the god, uh, Homer. Uh, you can even see here, I was able to find one photograph. I've not been to Eos to see this. Um, I, I found a, a good enough of an image to blow it up to see that indeed the text is derived from this passage that we see in Pas von Krenen's forgery. Um, some things never change. This uh, doesn't prevent this whole story from having created a bit of a firestorm in scholarship. Why would someone, after all, fake the discovery of Homer's tomb? Well, C.G. Hain and his pretended tomb of Homer takes this on in 1795 at the uh, uh, late 18th century period of the late Enlightenment. Um, according to Pas von Krenen's account, he encountered Homer's tomb, and it looked something like what you see before you. During the War of the Russians with the Turks, which was terminated in 1774 by the Peace of Foxani, a report uh, was spread that Pas von Krenen, being on board the Russian fleet, had discovered the tomb of Homer on the island of Neos. Um, that the monument was a sarcophagus 14 feet high, seven long, and four broad, consisting of six pieces, that on one of its sides was an inscription, probably the very same mentioned by Herodotus. So they're you could have a good uh, authority figure for this story. And here's the kicker, that when they opened the tomb, they found the skeleton had been in a sitting posture, and that before him stood a marble vessel in the form of an inkstand, a pen with a marble stylus, a sharp stone like a knife. So here we actually find proof of Homer as a person with an ink pot and a pen, and indeed, here we see a uh, sculpture, a fanciful sculpture of this very kind of figure of Homer seated um, as the visionary poet. Now, of course, there's a few things wrong with this. For one, um, Homer was not a person, but probably a lot of different people over a long period of time, transmitting the uh, poetry of the uh, Greek epics from one generation to another, traveling and singing this through oral tradition rather than necessarily written tradition. Um, what is this all about? Well, it, what it's really about is the debate about whether there was an historic Homer and a lot of people who wish there was and that there had been, and indeed that there be proof positive that there was. And so Pas von Green and whomever it was that published this false story um, generated an argument for an historic Homer, even though most of the scholarly evidence and indeed definitive scholarly, scholarly evidence demonstrates that there was no one person called Homer. But this is the epic uh, tradition of lies uh, of travel liars like Pas van Krenen. This desire to recreate things that are impossible, things uh, including the scattered figures of history, as you see in this wonderful painting by Ong of the apotheosis of Homer, behind him presumably Homer's tomb. This is a gigantic painting that hangs in the Louvre in Paris. And here you see an assemblage of all the great figures of literature and history, art and letters, um, an impossible image, an impossible scene of an impossible portrait of Homer seated, not with a pen, but nonetheless um, surrounded by all of these figures, an assertion, as it were, of the individual geniuses through history. Now, travel liars 
don't necessarily travel through history so much as they travel across geographical space and to an extent, of course, of time and discover things not in the depths of antiquity per se, like Pas van Kuenen in making this argument, but rather um, they find in these impossible places knowledge that is tempt that tempting and indeed uh, too good to be true for a modern readerly audience. Um, we saw, we see examples of this, for example, in the great medieval um, travel lies of Sir John Mandeville, um, if there was even such a person whose voyages of travels of St. John Mandeville, the knight to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, to the lands of great, the great Khan and of Prester John and so forth, in which he recounts the, the very same monstrous races that we encountered in the Nuremberg Chronicle and the works of Catesius and others in ancient, the ancient world, here replicated and in this edition published even into the 17th century. Here's the Blemyai with their uh, faces in their chests. Our copy of this magnificent book is wonderful for its inscription, um, tongue in cheek. He that believeth all that's in this book will be counted a fool by the next that in him, that is this book, look. Which brings us to one of the greatest travel liars of all time, certainly one of the most popular, the mysterious George Solmanazar. We don't, we don't actually, didn't actually know who he was. He had professed um, for a long time, from the early 18th century until his death, 60 years later, to have been a Formosan um, and to have published his great um, best-selling description of Formosa, as you see before you. Um, Formosa is a old or antique word for the island of um, Taiwan, off of the coast of China. And here you see an early Dutch map of the of the island of Formosa. It's an impossibly distant place, literally on the other side of the world, unlikely to be um, studied or investigated or explored. Um, um, and the claims of Salman Azar, of his people and his culture and his language and his society of Formosa, difficult to check. Um, and so he takes this canvas, this blank canvas of, a, of an impossibly remote place, um, with a different distant language to create um, a story of a distant land. Um, not a utopia in the tradition of Thomas More or Francis Bacon, but rather a bit of a dystopia, but one that is still uh, touched by forms of religion. And he creates this image of a temple, this tabernacle and altar, these strange altars of the sun and the moon with descriptions of their attributes with these elaborating uh, images to capture the imagination of even stories of their worship of the devil. Um, that's certainly always a subject of interest to anyone in any age. Uh, uh, and their uh, elaborate funerals, also their elaborate ritual slaughter of some 18,000 young boys b b below the age of nine, um, which is another one of their strange um, habits, which apparently would have been meant to discourage people from visiting. Um, the uh, made-up dress of the king and the queen, the viceroy and the viceroy's lady, and going down in the ranks, as it were, of society, following the traditions of costume books, which people would have been familiar with. So this, this, this strange story actually comes to people in a kind of familiar way. Um, here on the upper right-hand corner is a Formosan country bumpkin, just in case you were curious about what they might look like. Um, he also invents various and sundry uh, elaborate um, cultural details, cultural mores and traditions that sound so detailed that it's, it's, they, they give them a kind of plausibility. Um, he offers a system of weight and measures, and he names them, uh, giving them, giving them a transliteration, presumably from the original Formosan and spelling out the way they sound, um, and also the superstitions and the customs of the people. The key, of course, is that um, the real galling bit was Solman Azar, who was actually French um, from a, a poor family who decided to travel around Europe, claiming to be a con convert to Christianity from Japan, um, later ended up washed up on the English shore and decided to become a Formosan and create this fabulous story to sell books. He was a well-educated man who knew Latin and spent a lot of time as a tutor. And uh, he used what he little he knew of Greek to kind of create a pastiche uh, Latino Greek alphabet, um, not on uh, the Formosan alphabet. And it has a super simple basic set of uh, concepts behind it we don't have time to discuss. But 
it is perhaps the first constructed language, as linguists call it, that we have evidence of uh, in the history of the world, uh, literally a fake language to go with a fake people um, in this most elaborate of travel lies. Uh, we, uh, we also learn from this, um, he all gives us very little information with which to hang himself. So linguists and linguistics was not really a proper study at this time of modern um, Asian languages per se, or just beginning to be. Um, he offers a version of the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed, presumably in this language. Um, a a latter-day version of a constructed language is Klingon uh, from the Star Trek series, uh, this mysterious language of these warlike, um, ferocious aliens um, to which uh, various uh, scholars, including the linguist Mark Ockrand, uh, applies, has applied his knowledge as a, as a Trekkie, um, creating a dictionary that is a consistent uh, constructed language dictionary for Klingon. You can even read Hamlet in Klingon translation. Um, I found this uh, interesting quotation online uh, from these uh, rather warlike figures. 4,000 throats can be cut in one night by a running man. Um, a wonderful ethos for a, 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 a warlike and martial alien culture. You can even apparently attend or could have attended some years ago at the historic Mounds Theater, um, a Klingon Christmas carol, all spoken in perfect Klingon. This literature of the travel liar um, may arguably have been one of the principal contributors to the origin of the novel, the English novel that we all know and love and have for hundreds of years in the English language and in many others. Um, one of the early books to come out just within years, really within a decade or less, of, uh, for, of the uh, story of Solomon Azar's description of Formosa was Robinson Crusoe, which, um, after all, uh, the author claimed to have been written by himself as an autobiography. And indeed, Robinson Crusoe was widely read um, as, a, uh, as an autobiography. We also have um, Gulliver's Travels is another fantastical version of fictional version of this published um, perhaps uh, uh, two decades or so after Solomon Azar. And so the influence even of these rather absurd um, travel stories actually are profound for our own um, traditions of literary expression. The, the novel, um, you know, uh, these examples of early novels come from many other traditions as well. I mean, there are ancient traditions of um, uh, of travel lies, uh, one thinks of Iambolus's um, Islands of the Sun um, and so forth. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the Solomon Azar stamp is difficult not to see in some of these uh, stories, which become kind of critiques of European culture in the Enlightenment. Uh, indeed, Solomon Azar becomes a kind of uh, uh, a kind of poster child for the idea of revealed religion. He is somebody um, who who is a apparently a savage of Formosa, as it were, who comes to England, um, adopts the Christian religion, and professes a kind of wisdom uh, that derives from this impossibly exotic experience. Um, he even defends himself against critics, including um, uh, Edmund Haley, who uh, is one of the first to disprove Salman Azar's text by demonstrating that Salman Azar's, Salman Azar's description of the length of the day and the night is, is impossible um, according to the motions of the, uh, according to, to, to uh, astronomical observation. Gulliver's Travels is turned into fantastical um, stories, even uh, the, the stuff of children's literature um, in, the, in the tales of Baron Mann Munchausen, um, published um, in the late 18th century, around the time of the uh, Homer's tomb, um, under the title Gulliver, Gulliver Revived. Uh, and here you'll see the fantastical journeys of this famous, actual, as an actual real person, Baron von Munchausen, who sued or threatened to sue the English um, author and the uh, others who, who, who wrote in this tradition using his name in vain. He had distinguished himself as a, as a general in, in the uh, wars of the uh, late 18th century. Um, and Baron von Munchausen and visits the, the people of the dog star and the inhabitants of the moon and the, the origins of science fiction can also, of course, be linked to this tradition of travel liars. Uh, Baron von Munchausen even traveled um, to the bottom of the sea and rode on cannonballs. And of course, this is uh, perfect uh, material for, for the literature of children and indeed for anybody. There's a, a movie adaptation that was actually done by one of the makers of Monty Python some decades ago. And this continues even to our own Baltimore. 
uh, and the home of Johns Hopkins University uh, through the great figure of Lobagola. Lobagola was a uh, 19, late 1920s, uh, early 1930s uh, uh, media sensation. Um, his uh, actual name is Joseph Henry Lee, born in Baltimore in the Jim Crow South uh, in the late 19th century, who um, found a way to raise himself up um, both uh, through his notoriety, through his literary productions, but also by claiming to be this remarkable man who came from the African bush um, and learned perfect English uh, and revealed uh, wisdom through his recounting of his uh, stories of his experiences. He also claimed to be a descendant of one of the lost tribes of Israel, as you can see in the Francis Peace page describing the story of Lobagola, which was published by none other than Kanaf, the great, the eminent literary publishers in the year 1930. Um, so he he's an African American born in uh, Baltimore during the period of uh, of, uh, of Jim Crow and racist discrimination. Um, he also takes on the attributes of being an ancient from an ancient Jewish tradition, and he sort of embraces those. Um, minority uh, identities in order to make a story for himself and is indeed successful. Uh, we, uh, during the middle of coronavirus, as I was preparing to talk about Lobagola, I decided to look online because of course all, all, I didn't have anything to show you but had to talk about this and found a wonderful copy um, online uh, inscribed by Lobagola, no less, of the first edition of his story written out to a Reverend Father Kelly, the rector of the Church of Tom St. Thomas the Apostle in New York City, where Lobagola was a popular lecturer. Um, I, I begged to have this, and through uh, special permission from Winston Tav at the Dean of the Libraries, we were actually able to acquire this despite the lockdown and the closing of the libraries. So uh, coronavirus be damned, we uh, full steam ahead with the Bibliotheca Fictiva. Uh, so this class has been the inspiration for an inspired acquisition, but that's just the first part of the story. Um, indeed, uh, Lobagola, and here's a photograph of uh, Mr. Lee um, uh, who in the book. We, we, had, uh, we have one copy of Lobagola already in the collection, but I, I didn't have a photograph of the cover um, also made out to a um, another figure, uh, somebody who probably attended one of Lobagola's book lectures or his signing tours, um, uh, signed in July of 1930 with his motto, Struggle Begets Strength. Um, I'll get back to that in just a moment. Now, the funny thing is, a year ago, um, we acquired from a bookseller in London this wonderful piece of fan mail. Um, it is written by Lobagola and signed by him, a typescript, to a guy called um, Halpern. And indeed, uh, Mr. Halpern turned out, became a, a U.S. congressman for a period of 14 years after being a, uh, a serving in the New York State Senate. Um, he was actually, and this is not off, uh, out of sync with the story, um, one of the co-sponsors of the great civil rights legislation in the middle of the 1960s. I wonder if he derived some inspiration from this um, figure of Lobagola. Uh, we don't know if he knew that Lobagola was a fraud and to say an imposter, a travel liar who brought his travels with him to America, or if he, um, you know, he knew he was somebody who was overcoming, as it were, even through lies, uh, uh, his limitations of circumstances in order to make a life for himself. In any event, we have this wonderful letter and in it, it mentions a drawing uh, in regard, second paragraph, in regard to your drawing of me, to be honest with you, I really do not know anything about that art. Therefore, anything that I might say would not carry such much weight. However, let me say this. I think that it is an excellent copy of the one that was in the New York Times of the 16th. And if you look at the date above, this is March 1930. So March 16, 1930. And I do not believe that anyone can say differently. What happened was Mr. Halpern sent a letter to Lobagolo, alas, we do not have that, with a drawing copied after this New York Times article asking Lobagola to sign it. How do I know that? I don't necessarily know that from this letter, but I do because when I was looking for a copy of Lobagola um, for our purposes, I also came across this drawing, this very drawing by Mr. Halpern, signed 1930. 
This we acquired from a bookseller in the heart of the coronavirus, New York State. London, New York, Lobagola, all roads seem to lead to Baltimore. And indeed, if you look at the New York Times in March 16, 1930, there's the drawing by a man called Bry, and here is the copy by Halpern. So there's a wonderful match made in heaven, a forgery family reunion of sorts, um, all roads leading to Baltimore and to the Bibliotheca Fictiva, despite the limitations that we're all under in our um, self-imposed quarantine. And there at the letter, in the bottom of the letter is again the motto, struggle begat strength. This leads to uh, the final part of our class, which I wanted to move to, which is the area where the motivations of forgers is quite clear. It's entirely financial. Um, now we know Lobagola and Salmanazar did uh, also were motivated by finance to sell books, um, but we also have another layer of forgery in which people are trying to make unique books that everybody wants to have. I've placed some nice marbled end papers to create an aesthetic sense because a lot of these forgeries are aesthetic um, and not just intellectual. They are um, about having the impossibly rare and the beautiful and the sumptuous objects, contact relics, as it were, with the distant past that nobody gets to have except those who are lucky and have discretion and virtu and can sort through all the, the, uh, the, uh, the things out there to find great treasure. And this takes us to this era of bibliomania, um, this uh, idea of information overload, but also the excitement of, of the belief that you could have all of human knowledge. And indeed, some of the greatest gems, the uh, contact relics of uh, the literature of the, of the distant and not so distant past at your fingertips. Um, this fantasy of the endless library, which uh, in a sense becomes a metaphor for what we possess now and how we're exchanging information today through the internet, the greatest conduit of fake news that perhaps ever was. Uh, but here we have a 17th century image of a real Renaissance library um, uh, at uh, Saint-Germain uh, that is no longer with us, uh, but nonetheless uh, represents this desire, this ambition, this love of books and the profusion of knowledge that um, I hope I uh, uh, express to you as somebody who works in the magnificent libraries at Johns Hopkins. Um, spaces like this um, mirrored in the John Work Garrett Library at Evergreen and the George Peabody Library and so much more. The, uh, that libraries uh, are cathedrals of books, uh, as this image portrays. Um, the cathedrals of the Roman Catholic tradition uh, here transformed into a kind of cathedral of learning in the age of enlightenment and beyond. This leads to an incurable disease um, that was diagnosed uh, perhaps most profoundly by Thomas Frognall Dibden uh, with his publication of the book Bibliomania or Book Madness, a bibliographical romance, which describes this, the, um, the uh, desire, the love, the pathology of the book collector who must have the greatest and the, the best and the, the rarest and the, the, the impossibly rare things of the world, um, things that only exist on the island of lost books, as it were, uh, fantasies uh, made realities. And his book, The Bibliomania, is a kind of um, decameron. It's kind of a, a series of stories of fantasies, of conversations, for example, as you see the figures on the right, of bibliophiles with uh, the great father of English printing, William Caxton, for example, a dialogue in the shades. Now, the, uh, the haunts uh, that emerged around this culture, the auctions of books, um, have never left us. This is where we still go today to build great research collections like the Bibliotheca Fictiva. Many people are looking for real things. We're looking for real as well as things that are fake. And also a caricature that emerges in the 18th and the 19th centuries in the great age of bibliomania of uh, the, uh, the kind of ridiculousness of this adventure of trying to acquire the impossible, um, the, the ultra rare. Uh, and uh, caricatures emerge, such as the book Fool, as you see on the left, um, which comes out of Sebastian Brandt's Ship of Fools, a kind of um, leveling uh, satire on all the different occupations and preoccupations and vanities of humankind. Here, I guess you would say, is the, the book fool, the scholar fool, um, who collects books, doesn't read them per se, but dusts them with a, dust, um, uh, with, with a duster. Here's another version of the uh, book collector who's more interested in keeping the dust off his books than necessarily in reading them. 
And here, the, the bibliomane who ultimately suffers the fate of being crushed to death by um, his love and ambition to own and possess all of human knowledge. Um, this leads to a kind of fiction that is itself productive of rare books. Uh, here um, is uh, a passage and uh, some elements of a super limited edition uh, English translation of The Bibliomaniac, a story written by the great bookman uh, Charles Nodier, Nodier of the early 19th century. This copy printed in 150 limited edition on Japan paper, each one individually numbered. These are the kinds of things that bibliophiles really go for. Um, and uh, on the left is our, uh, our figure, um, Theodore, the lover of, of God, and for him the God is books. Um, his temple is his library. Um, here he is dreaming on the left of these two diabolical figures grabbing one of his Aldine, super rare 15th century, perfect Greek books with huge margins, untrimmed, uh, lily white as the day it came off of the, the printing press. Uh, and and these, these terrible book uh, uh, sophisticators, as they might have been called, who take their fatal shears and their bleach to perfect and fake books and, and try to improve them and sell them as if they were the real thing, the originals. Um, and indeed, these are real figures, Pergold and Houdier, who improved books and also uh, tended to ruin them in many ways, um, bleaching the annotations, the things that we care about as scholars today in order to make to bring them to this sort of snowy white perfection. So uh, the bibliomania has a kind of pathological quality that that ironically leads to uh, and drives the destruction of books. The greatest bibliomaniac perhaps of them all is Sir Thomas Phillips, who you see on the left, who never saw a manuscript he probably didn't want to buy. Um, and uh, at the Grolier Club of New York, a, a society dedicated to bibliomaniacs, um, you'll see a room that's filled with artifacts, uh, pieces of vellum and parchment, or a kind of shrine to Sir Thomas Phillips himself, who numbered uh, meticulously the tens of thousands of manuscripts that he acquired um, uh, in his, uh, and here you see a book stamp, um, uh, such as the, one of the ones that he would have used to number these artifacts. He would buy these from um, rag pickers and people who cleared out the attics of uh, castles and country houses, uh, and acquired them, um, hoovering them up throughout the 19th century. He was a wealthy baronet. Indeed, um, at, on his country estate at Middle Hill, he, he um, set up his own private printing press on Broadway Tower on his estate in order to publish extremely important books about his rare manuscripts in his collection. Um, and here he's, they're all privately printed as vanity imprints, and he takes on a kind of uh, Latinate name nomenclature. Um, this is his middle pill press, uh, Typus Medio Montanus, Inturi Latiense, Latiense, um, Impressos, that is to say, in the Broadway Tower. It was printed in 1825. Takes on the vestiges of kind of antiquity, but in reality, it's all the fantasy of a, of a collector who wishes to believe that everything he has is worth printing about, or at least some of the things. And it is he who acquired this artifact that is now in the Bibliotheca Fictiva, uh, an ancient Greek manuscript describing none other than the secret art of icon painting, um, about which we know very little, um, despite the fact that it was the dominant um, medieval art form in the Byzantine world. This is a forgery of Constantine Simonides, a rather um, accomplished forger um, who was born in Greece uh, and who claimed uh, 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 that this was composed on the learned island of Athos. Uh, in reality, it's just artificially aged vellum um, and this uh, Greek minuscule uh, letter forms. Uh, interestingly, uh, nobody has yet taken on this text and worked on it um, thoroughly. So the actual textual content is something that needs, that needs work um, for anyone who's got some time is interested in, Greeks and like, in Greek and likes forgery. Um, but as I say, this is supposedly a lost Byzantine uh, uh, treatise painting of 52 leaves in mock medieval demotic Greek minuscule, supposedly written by one Melietos of Chios, uh, but indeed, uh, and indeed uh, composed, as we know, um, on the island of Athos. And Simonides himself embodies the mystique of the learned culture of the ancient world. How could somebody get their hands on ancient Greek manuscripts? In reality, they don't survive um, hardly at all on parchment. Um, 
and certainly not as original compositions in 52 pages of complete texts. But the island of Athos was always associated with ancient Greek knowledge. Indeed, at one point there was a proposal to make a gigantic um, sculptural um, um, shrine to Alexander the Great on this island. Um, it was described in John Mandeville's travel wire accounts of his uh, uh, expeditions to the great Khan and Prester John as this wonderful space and land where these learned scholars would, uh, of, of the Byzantine and Greek worlds would, would um, break, unlock the mysteries of the heavens. And indeed it was covered and is covered to this day with dozens of monasteries with great libraries, including um, fragments of one of the oldest um, great uncial Bibles um, that survive uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, Codex, uh, Codex Sinaiticus that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, but this was sold by Constantine Simonides to um, Sir Thomas Phillips, uh, thanks to all of this lore um, and uh, uh, Phillips' uh, gullibility, his susceptibility to this desire to have the most ancient and the most impossible things, he bought this manuscript along with fragments of Hesiod and Acreon and indeed Homer's Iliad. We have um, also people who forged the artifact, including forged bindings. This is um, a recent addition to the um, collection. I started with Homer and I'm now back to Homer. Uh, again, here is a 1540 edition of Homer um, from, with an incredibly elaborate binding that is incredibly rare. It is one of a sequence of so-called Apollo and Pegasus bindings. These are some of the most sought after Renaissance bindings in the world. Um, and they're beautifully gilt. And you'll see some of them are in dark colors of brown and black, um, others in green and brown, and then others in red. These come from a famous Renaissance library of one Giovanni Battista Grimaldi, a great banking magnate of the city of Genoa. Um, this is an image of his palace where this collection uh, existed. And he created uh, what was, he called a uh, a, a, a una libraria finita, or like a complete library of human knowledge. It was 144 volumes. There's a slap down challenge right there. It's already anything from that library is rare. And he had all of them essentially bound in the same way with the stamp of Apollo and Pegasus. Um, and the ancient texts he bound in black, brown, green bindings. And then the moderns, which are largely Italian language texts in red, um, these are perfect for forgers, um, but there also are real versions of these. Um, in fact, one of the last uh, real Apollo and Pegasus bindings to appear at auction fetched $106,000 uh, at Christie's in 2004. That's how much people value these incredibly rare, um, sumptuously bound books. Um, there were, however, three very active Apollo and Pegasus binding forgers in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries um, who were responsible for uh, about 45 um, uh, of the uh, known forgeries th uh, thus far. And uh, of, the, so, uh, of the 144 known authentic examples of, of the library. Um, this is our copy of Homer, which is in a dark binding because it's an ancient text. Um, uh, this one probably forged by Vittorio Villa of Bologna, who was one of these very active figures. And um, of course, what did these forgers do but try to find uh, books pu published around the time of Grimaldi or that could have or published before his lifetime that would have been candidates for his library, gaps perhaps in the record of those that were known. And then they would simply impose on the, what were probably plain bindings, these elaborate gilt elements to make them look like the others and applying in the 19th and the early 20th centuries, this impression, this stamp that is the Apollo and Pegasus. As you see here, Apollo in his chariot and Pegasus standing um, on the mountain with the Greek motto around that is translated straight and not crooked. Um, on the right is a real uh, uh, book from the library. Um, this is a red modern uh, Tuscan language dictionary in the, um, in the library of Grimaldi, and its wheel has six spokes. And this is how you know that these are forgeries. Our book, our fake Homer, has four. Uh, sometimes it comes down to the smallest details of duplication that are diff difficult to notice. Um, in order to identify these forgeries, but that is, of course, what it is. 
There are incredibly perverse forgers, of course, as well. We have this magnificent edition of the Fairy Queen of Edmund Spencer in our collection, um, published by Lowndes in 1611. Um, this uh, is signed by none other than Michael Drayton and, and dated 1613. Uh, here's an image of Drayton, the great poet um, who was a follower uh, of the um, tradition of Spencerian poetry and who is known indeed to have uh, collaborated with Spencer on poetical adventures. And so it is. it could be believed that Drayton had a kind of red phone to Spencer's poetical imagination and anything that Drayton would have written in his own lifetime about the Fairy Queen would be incredibly valuable to literary scholars. Um, and thus, uh, anything in our copy of the Bibliotheca Fictiva copy of Michael Drayton's signed version with annotations becomes incredibly valuable, not only as an artifact to be bought by book collectors, but also by scholars interested in rewriting literary history. And indeed, that is exactly what the forger who put Michael Drayton's name in this ex in his, that expert signature forgery, John Payne Collier, did. He was actually an editor of one of the so-called definitive editions of Spencer in the late 19th century, which stood for many decades as, a, as an authority text. Um, and indeed, if you open our copy of the Fairy Queen, but supposedly Drayton's copy, here are telltale notes by John Payne Collier saying, oh my God, this is Drayton's copy. Wow, this is an incredibly important thing, adding tremendous value indeed to this book. And if you go through our copy, you'll see Michael Drayton, in air quotes, his Renaissance annotation. So these in the text become thrice in the margins. Him becomes her, other becomes neither. Uh, and these improve the rhyme scheme and the meter of the text, probably fixing what were compositional errors during the production of the book. These are created by um, John Payne Collier to fix the text through the eyes of an authoritative figure around the time that the text was written. Um, and one of the most famous passages is this, where the word make is turned into hold. If you go through this particular um, uh, uh, piece of the poem, you'll see that the rhyme scheme should match. So make should rhyme with bold and told, but it does not. And so our friend John Payne Collier decided to fix that by making Michael Drayton uh, write in the 1613, uh, just a couple years after this book was printed, the word hold. And if you go to the Edmund Spencer edition of John Payne Collier and you look at the correction, wants to hold, and note seven and go down, it tells you hold is make, as you see above in the 1611 edition, in all the old editions. And we may be sure that hold was Spencer's word, not only because the rhyme requires it, as I've shown you above, but because it is written in the margin opposite to make uh, in Drayton's copy of the folio 1611 now before us. We have therefore not hesitated regarding the substitution. So here uh, is, the, is the rub that actually um, this is a fabrication of the imagination of a learned forger and a learned scholar, which is a, a possible combination, a dangerous one indeed. And we have Renaissance verse in our collection um, that also is incredibly rare. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this little piece of doggerel was actually written by Ben Johnson, as the initials below say, and presented by him to another literary friend, Sir William Davenant. Um, the only problem is that Davenant wasn't knighted a sir until some years after Ben Johnson was dead. And so this is absolutely impossible and a perfect example of how the, there, there needs to be an incredibly um, precise economy of literary manuscript forgery. The minute you give one thing too much away, it hangs the rest of the forgery um, on the gallows. Which leads finally to um, some of the, the, the my favorite forgeries in the collection, including this wonderful book from none other than William Shakespeare's own library. Talk about a ex libris par excellence. Um, ironically, this book was lent in the 1960s to an exhibition on forgeries held at the Peabody Library um, by a private collector, um, Stuart Schimmel, who collected forgeries. It, uh, after his death, some years ago, it came at auction and we acquired it and reunited it, as it were, with the Sheridan Libraries at Johns Hopkins. And it, too, is now a part of this story and something I can share with you as a result. Uh, and it's a wonderful, juicy book because it's none other than a discovery of a secret plot by the Jesuits to assassinate King James of England. 
Uh, the autograph is a, a rather learned one because it follows very carefully one of the few exemplars of Shakespeare's autograph that is known to be authentic, that which was uh, preserved in his will um, at the, uh, the National Archives in London. There are annotations throughout the book, furthermore, and uh, while most of those are deeply illegible or, or, or somewhat illegible, at least to my eyes, you can still make out William Shakespeare writing his signature over and over again, or his autograph, um, W.S., um, claiming, as it were, authorship of these annotations about this, this dubious uh, uh, plot against the king. Perhaps um, William Shakespeare was a part of it. Probably not, according to these, uh, these forged notes, because the forger, William Henry Ireland, a great Shakespeare, Shakespeare forger of the late 18th and the early 19th centuries, mainly wanted to prove that William Shakespeare was a good Protestant. And so um, these notes should be indicating his outrage at a Catholic plot against the king, good king of England. And William Henry Ireland uh, published a uh, catalog of Shakespeare's libraries, having um, uh, discovered all of these and indeed created these forgeries. Uh, here, uh, number 534 is our book in the Bibliotheca Fictiva, um, described in green Morocco binding as indeed our copy in the collection is. Um, so, bibliomaniacal forgery. Uh, there, we would like to have added this object to our William Henry Ireland gathering, one of the finest in the world, um, held by a, uh, uh, an employee at Christie's. Um, it is a manuscript from a collection of William Henry Ireland forgeries, uh, including many samples of William Shakespeare's autograph, in air quotes, of course, all forgeries of William Henry Ireland. Indeed, it seems like evidence of his practicing forging William Shakespeare's autograph that appears on our copy in the Bibliotheca Fictiva of that book I just showed you from Shakespeare's library, as it were. Original verses um, beneath the skill of the bard, but nonetheless uh, also uh, to be uh, pawned off by William Henry Ireland as Shakespeare's. Uh, and then this absolutely wonderful letter, this manuscript letter by William Shakespeare to none other than Yes, Anne Hathaway, his neglected wife. And just to prove his affection for his wife as a good husband, uh, in the wax seal is a lock of his hair. This is one we dearly would have loved to add to our Bibliotheca Fictiva collection in the auction that took place just a few months ago in London. Um, uh, the sale of various manuscript masterpieces from the Shoyan collection, a great Scandinavian collection that also possesses, amongst other things, um, the Tower of Babel Stile that I uh, talked about at the beginning of our, um, of our course. Uh, unfortunately, the price realized was a princely sum for these forged manuscript objects, doubling the uh, high end of the estimate. And so, unfortunately, this is one of those fish that got away. Somebody else nabbed it, in this case, Harvard, and, and they put it on the back of their, uh, their trailer and, and rode off with it to Cambridge, Massachusetts. You can't win them all. And so we conclude our course, uh, Fakes, Lies, uh, and, sorry, Fake News, A History of Forgery from the Flood to the Apocalypse, with the warning that I keep giving and uh, that I probably don't need to give any more, caveat lector, reader beware. Um, whether it be travel liars or would-be Shakespeare's, we have to question everything we see. And even if we poke our heads out into the, uh, the vast expanses of the universe, we have to make sure that what we're seeing in front of us, what we're reading, what we're encountering is indeed the real thing. Thank you very much.